Amen. All right. Technically, next week we're going to be get beginning a new Bible study on a new book. It's going to be the book of Matthew. Now, tonight we're going to do, and I do this pretty often, uh, it, it, in the situations when there is a, a larger book. And there are, it will be an introduction this evening. I want to go over just some basic facts of the book of Matthew. Some of the things that I usually go over is this. The authorship, uh, the audience... And then I want to talk about some overlapping subjects, and that will be the other four Gospels. And then I want to touch on some themes. Now, uh, to begin, I want you to turn over in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4. As I often recommend, if you have a bulletin there, you can slide that in when you need to. So Luke chapter number 4. We're going to be comparing Scripture with Scripture here quickly. We refer to... The first four books of the New Testament as the Gospels. That's what we refer to them as, and they're rightly referred to as that. Now, here in Luke chapter number 4, I want to define for you what the word Gospel means. What does it mean? It says here in Luke chapter number 4, verse number 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. So it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now this is a quotation from the Old Testament. I want you to turn over to Isaiah chapter number 61. Isaiah chapter number 61. We're going to define here what the word gospel means. What does the word gospel mean? <clears throat> the book of Matthew is referred to as the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says in Isaiah chapter number 61, verse number 1, this is what Luke 4 was quoting that we just read, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Now it's real important to compare Scripture with Scripture. And right here we have a perfect example of that. We can see right here when this is being quoted that there are some words that are exchanged out. There are some words that are used synonymously or used interchangeably. And the series of words are, number one, we see in Isaiah 61, it says good tidings. Now that means good news. That's what we would say today in our modern vernacular today. When that is being quoted in Luke chapter number 4, it says the gospel. So we can see that what the word gospel means, it's not referring to gospel music. That's what everybody thinks of when I'm at the door preaching the gospel to them. I'll ask them, hey, do you know what the word gospel means? Like, yeah, it's gospel music, right? That's not what the word itself means. It actually means good news. What the Bible says is good tidings. So go back to Matthew chapter number 1. It's rightfully referred to as good tidings because it's the message of salvation. Now, particularly, it's the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. And to be even more specific, if we were to be even more specific, it's the message of salvation through Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Now, the Gospels, what they do is they record that. They record the entire life of Jesus. When we look at what are the Gospels about, a lot of people, go sit down, Jeremiah, right now. Sit down right here. When we look at, shh, sit down. When we look at, uh, uh, you know, the, all of the different books in the New Testament. We look at all the different books in the New Testament. You have the, the epistles of Paul. You have, you know, obviously Peter, James, all of these different authors, all of these different books. A lot of people would usually only be familiar with probably a couple of them. You know, the book of Revelation, they would be familiar with. But, you know, another series of books that a lot of people would be familiar with would be the Gospels. And in particular, most of them would be familiar with the majority of people, that is, and especially Christians. If they're not familiar with many books of the New Testament or many books of the Bible, usually they would be familiar with the book of Matthew. And that is because it records the life of Jesus. The Gospels are very, very significant books. And I'm excited about preaching through the book of Matthew. Uh, actually, Brother Hall was the one that had recommended it. And I had thought about it in the past. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, it's probably my favorite Gospel for a lot of different reasons. And, uh, and I'll explain a couple of those points to you tonight. So go back with me, if you can, to Matthew chapter number 1. I want you to look with me at the very beginning. The very, very beginning of Matthew chapter number 1 there. And it tells us that, it, that it's about what's being recorded and what's being discussed is the life of Jesus. It says this in Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So notice it says the book of. That's telling you what it's about. What is? If you ask the question, what are the Gospels about? In a very general sense, if you wanted to give someone an answer, and we should be prepared to answer people with these types of questions, it's about Jesus. That's a very easy, simple answer. It's about Jesus. And to be more specific, it's about the Gospel of Jesus. 
And that's why we refer to them. And it's referred rightfully so as the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would be the life of Jesus Christ. It would be the death of Jesus Christ. The burial of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just some basic facts about the book of Matthew. Number one is it's the first book in the New Testament. Now that is why most people are familiar with it. A lot of people would be very familiar with the book of Genesis, wouldn't they? Why? Because it's the very first book in the Bible. When people say, hey, I'm going to read my Bible. It's New Year's Day. You know, uh, first day, you know, uh, I need a New Year's resolution. And the first day of the year, January 1st, what am I going to do? A lot of people, they want to get in touch with their spiritual life, right? They want to try to, you know, rejuvenate themselves. So what do they do? They, they make some sort of, you know, a uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 promise or oath or something that they're going to begin, a resolution that they're going to begin reading their Bible. And where do they start? Either the very beginning of the Old Testament or the very beginning of the New Testament. I know that I did this a few different times. Not necessarily, you know, New Year's, uh, uh, a New Year's resolution for that purpose, but a few different times I made the decision, hey, I want to start reading my Bible. This is before I, you know, became real serious in my Christianity. And I, I would always open up to, the. I wanted to go to the New Testament, I would open up to the book of Matthew. And I'd get about five, six chapters in at that time, and I would slowly dwindle out, right? I'd swo slowly fall away. And a lot of people do this. That's one of the reasons why people are very familiar with it. So it's the very first book in the New Testament, and it is the 40th book in the Bible. That's good to know as well. In our Bible, it is the 40th book. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. One of the very important things about the book of Matthew, and one of the major differences, obviously it's the first book in the New Testament that has to do with the New Covenant, but it records Jesus' appearance. And let me say this, everything in the Old Testament is pointing towards Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament is pointing towards Jesus Christ, and specifically His death, burial, and resurrection. Everything that's recorded as far as Scripture in the New Testament that is after the life of Jesus is just pointing back to Jesus Christ. Everything. It all has to do with the Messiah. It all has to do with the Christ. The whole Old Testament is just preaching about the coming of the Messiah. That's why it's so significant. It's, it's just building up and it's just giving you more information as time goes on about the Lord Jesus Christ to come. Obviously the name was not revealed, but it's about the Messiah. It'll talk about things about the kingdom. Now, what does the kingdom have to do with it? Obviously, it pertains to the king. It talks about salvation. How does salvation come? It comes through the Messiah. It follows the line of the genealogy. And you have just random books like the book of Ruth. And you're like, why is this book in here? It's following the line of the Messiah who is to come. You have the discussions of the kings of Judah. And this real heavy emphasis put on the kings of Judah. You have David. You have Solomon. And you can see that it's clearly following a particular stream, a particular stream of, of, of uh, you know, ancestry. Why? Because everything in the Old Testament is pointing towards the Messiah. Everything. You get to the New Testament and bam, the very first book, you open it up, you know what it has to do with? The Messiah. So the book of Matthew is an extremely significant book. Now one of the reasons why it's my favorite book would, would tie in with the fact that there's 28 chapters. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of information in the book of Matthew. You know, there are theories out there of, of, uh, that comes from scholarship and all of these theologians that would say that the book of Matthew derived from the book of Mark because there are some similarities. But that's, that's you know, obviously we don't believe that. Obviously, each one of them were independent authors that sat down. One person wasn't copying another person. Those types of people would, you know, that would believe such a thing, whether, you know, maybe some of them don't even realize it, but that's coming from an unbelieving mindset. Because I don't believe that you know, Matthew sat down and was just copying Mark. I believe that the Holy Spirit you know, endowed him with, with the Spirit for him to be able to write the words that we read. So we believe that this is inspired scripture. It's the very first book that we have in the New Testament, which be considered you know, a, a, a part of what would be called, like we were talking about earlier, the Christian Bible. There are 28 chapters. There are 28 chapters. It begins here in chapter number one with the birth of Jesus Christ. That's what we have in the very beginning of the book of Matthew. We have the genealogy there. And then verse number 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. So he just jumps right into, on this wise means in this way, basically, is how we would word that today. So he just jumps right into and how Jesus Christ came about, how he was born, how, you know, he, uh, what family he was born into. Now I want you to flip over to um, Matthew chapter number 28. Let's look at the very end. So we can see where it begins and where it ends. 
But what takes place within the middle of the pages, obviously, is, you know, uh, at that point implicit. But it looks at verse number 19. Let's look at that. It says in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. If we compare this to Acts chapter number 1 and also the other Gospels, it's very clear that this is the departing, if you will, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had already died, he was already buried, and he had risen from the dead. And what's going on right now is he has appeared unto his disciples for 40 days, and then he's about to ascend into heaven. These are the, the last words that were spoken to the apostles or that were spoken to the disciples. So it begins with his birth with his arrival into this world, and then it ends with, think about this, his departure out of this world. So, what is going on in Matthew, the book of Matthew, it's just recording, as it says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. What does it mean, generation? It's saying the life of Jesus Christ, which is, which is essentially the gospel. Now, the other thing I want to deal with is authorship. When I had preached on the book of Lamentations not too long ago, I had talked about how I didn't see a lot of evidence for Jeremiah being the author of the book of Lamentations. So I completely retract that statement. Now I know I had, while we were going through the book of Lamentations, I had reread it, listened to it, studied it, and I had pulled out and uh, extracted a few statements that actually did seem very likely that Jeremiah was the author. These, these uh, 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 subtitles, if you will, up here, the titles of each chapter, the titles of, of the books and things like that, they're not inspired scripture. They were added much, much later. And this is basically commentary that was added much later. When you see that there at the top of you know, uh, uh, the beginning of the book of Matthew here where it says, The Gospel According to St. Matthew, chapter 1. That was not what Matthew wrote down or whoever authored this. That is not inspired scripture. That is not a part of, you know, as you see there where it begins and says the book of, genera the, book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Those were not written at the same time and that is not inspired by the Holy Ghost. This was added much later and this is the interpretation of those that were compiling, you know, uh, all of the books of the Bible and putting them together and translating them. They were adding these titles for, obviously, convenience sake. And I, I enjoy having the chapters. I enjoy having the verses. It's perfect while, you know, we're in church and we're, I'm preaching. I can tell you what passage to turn to. You can get there, you know, immediately. So th those are good to have, but you need to understand that that is not inspired scripture. And when it tells you the gospel according to St. Matthew, that, did not, that was not written down by the author. This is just somebody's interpretation of who they believe wrote down this book and, and uh, uh, authored this book as far as who was the human instrument used by the Lord. Now, as I said, when I preached through the book of Lamentations, I said that I felt no compelling evidence that Jeremiah was the author. When I ended up you know, finishing the book, I felt much more convinced that it was because I had found a few things while I had went through it and I pointed those things out and I notated them. Uh, since then I've read through the book of Jeremiah and I've, I've located a few other things that seem to fall in line with you know, Jeremiah being the author, other things as far as timing and, and things of that sort. And I'm going to make this same statement and maybe I'll retract it later, but I looked up a bunch of things and, and, and uh, I have no reason to believe that, that Matthew, and, and, and either way, I'm not doubting anything, but I have no reason to believe personally that Matthew is the author of the book of Matthew, what we refer to as the gospel according to St. Matthew. Now, like I said, that's, I first prefaced that to explain to you that that is not inspired scripture. That statement, the gospel according to St. Matthew, that is not what was written down originally. That was added as commentary later, and I looked up reasons why people would think that Matthew was the author. It's purely tradition. That's all that it is. It's just tradition. And hey, maybe is it possible that tradition has been in some way passed down properly and accurately? Turn around, Jeremiah. Yeah, it's possible. But I ha I'm not going to hang my hat on something like that. And uh, this is a little bit different than the book of Jeremiah or Lamentations. Book of Jeremiah and Lamentations. You can compare those two books. And we, all, we know for a fact that Jeremiah authored the book of Jeremiah. So you can go to the book of Jeremiah. You can compare quotations within that and then 
Lamentations, where the, the author is anonymous, where it doesn't, he doesn't announce you know, who he is. And you can try to work things out, but we have no other scripture where you know, Matthew has authored it, and he announces or proclaims that he is the author. So if you notice something, you know, let me know. I like to try to figure those things out, just like I, you know, I feel like I've sealed the, uh, you know, uh, the fate as far as who is the author of the book of Hebrews. I think it's extremely clear that Paul is the author of the book of Hebrews. And I like to study those things out, and I think that sometimes they're, you know, God wants us to know, sometimes it doesn't matter. So, uh, as far as the authorship of the book of Matthew, I don't see you know, any compelling reason to think that uh, Matthew is for sure the author. You know, there's no evidence either way whether he actually was the author. But there's nothing wrong with us referring to it that way. That's just what we know this gospel as. Um, the audience is another thing that I wanted to speak about here for a few minutes. And this is pretty big. So... Um, the book of Matthew is geared towards the Jews. It is 100% very clearly geared towards the Jews. And I would even word it in such a way that it has a Jewish undertone or a Jewish flavor to it. And it's even the delivery of it is very Jewish. What I mean by that in specific is that it's geared towards those that are very familiar with the Old Testament. It's written to someone that is very, very familiar with the Old Testament. Now I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. There are many people that would, they, they wouldn't say what I just said exactly, but they would, the way that they would word it is this. They would say, the book of Matthew is written to the Jews. They would say, the book of Matthew is written to the Jews. And what they mean by that is that it's written to the Jews and not to you. That's their purpose. It's not for you. And there are some people that just that go so far as to even say that, that we shouldn't even be reading the book of Matthew. That it's not for us. And, that, and then there's another group that they don't go quite as far as that. They can say, hey, you can read it, but you shouldn't be getting your doctrine from it. Sit down and don't get up again. You can read it. But you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be trying to take your doctrine from it. And obviously this comes from a dispensational type of philosophy. Like your doctrine should not be coming from the book of Matthew. Those people would even say, hey, your doctrine shouldn't be coming from really any of the Gospels. A lot of those people would say that. Right? Now, I want you to look with me at 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and see what that says. It says in verse number 16, 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, corrupt, for correction, I'm sorry, for instruction in righteousness. So notice that the Bible teaches that all Scripture... So let me ask you a question. Is the book of Matthew Scripture? You say yes. Okay? Well then the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Saying that it's God breathed. That God spoke these words basically. And then it goes on to say this. This is the important part. And is profitable... For doctrine. So this is even the Apostle Paul that is teaching this. And a lot of these dispensationalists, what do they say? When they, when they speak of, hey, you shouldn't be going to Matthew, who do they tell you that you should be going to? Where should you be getting your doctrine from? They would say, oh, only from the Pauline epistles. You, have, you, know, you only have 13 books that you're allowed to get your doctrine from. But even Paul himself says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So he's telling you that anything that's Scripture, that's Old Testament, that's New Testament, any Scripture that for you it's profitable for doctrine. Now all of these people would admit, hey, yeah, the book of Matthew is Scripture, but then they, what would they say? Yeah, but it's not profitable for doctrine, not for you. But notice how he makes it crystal clear, all Scripture, every bit of it. So can we derive, when we're studying and we're going through as a church, the book of Matthew, can we learn doctrine from the book of Matthew? The Apostle Paul says, yes, you can. So this is for any book that we're studying. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, anything. If it's scripture, which that's the 66 books that we have right here. If it's scripture, we can learn doctrine from it. What else? Reproof. Correction. Those are kind of the same thing. And then it says, instruction in righteousness. Obviously, in the book of Matthew, we have some great teachings, instructions in righteousness. You know, when I was a freshman in high school, I went to a Christian school, and one of the things that we learned were the Beatitudes. 
And when you look throughout the Bible, there's so many great truths that are taught in all of the books of the Bible. But when you, when you get just Jesus' words, just the pure words of God, just you know, standing there and just preaching sermons, just straight from the mouth of God, it's just nugget after nugget. Just, just pure, pure truth where you can just derive so much about life. So many things about, as it says, instruction and righteousness. One of the things that we're going to learn a lot from the book of Matthew is instruction in righteousness. Why? Because there's a lot of red letters in the book of Matthew. There's a lot of just Jesus preaching. A lot of truth. Jesus even said that, hey, people wanted to, they, they, you know, they were dying to hear the things of what I'm preaching to you. And how we, how their ears were blessed because they were able to hear the words that Jesus spoke. Why? Because there were precious truths. Because it was just unfiltered truth that was just coming straight from Jesus' mouth. And what was the purpose of the, the Beatitudes? The Sermon on the Mount, when we look at all of the different things that were taught there. Instructions and righteousness. We look at a lot of the things that Jesus is doing. He's teaching people about righteousness, isn't he? He's teaching them about how to live their lives. All different types of things like that. So the book of Matthew is profitable for doctrine. It is profitable for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Go back with me to the book of Matthew. Another thing I want to point out... And and this is going to kind of uh, uh, um, you know, segue us into the themes of the, uh, the book of Matthew. And that is themes, plural. There's numerous themes. Now, there's a, there's a particular order of the books of the Bible. There's an order of the Old Testament and how the Old Testament books are laid out. And uh, I believe that it was, it was divine and that it was providential the way in which the books of the Bible were put into the particular order that they are in and the order that we have. You know, it's not a coincidence that begins with Genesis and ends with Revelation. It's not a coincidence. I believe that God's hand was in that and that he put them in that particular order when we were, you know, given and it was, you know, the stamp of approval and all of that. The, the translation, I believe he led that whole entire process to what we have today in the King James Bible. Now... If you look at the Old Testament, there's, and I don't want to delve too much into the Old Testament order. What I want to focus on right now is the New Testament. If you follow the Old Testament, uh, you know, there's, there's certain categories that the books are in. And it's very interesting that if you look at Malachi, I want you to look at Malachi chapter number 4. If you look at the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter number 4, he tells us in verse number 4, actually let's look at verse number 2. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, this is the last book of the Old Testament. And the very last thing that is said, it says this, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise. Now watch this, with healing in His wings. Notice Son there is S-U-N. There's a lot of you know, symbolism when it comes to you know, the actual Son as far as the solar system with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that's because the Creator, He did that in such a way that it would depict and symbolize the Lord. So it's obviously speaking of Jesus there, you know, the Son of God. And it says, And he shall go forth and grow up, and ye shall grow, go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him, and Oreb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Watch this. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now let me ask you a question. As far as events occurring and prophecies to happen, after the last prophecy was proclaimed from the lips of an Old Testament prophet, it was pinned down. What was the very next event that took place? The very next event, prophetic event that took place. We can look at Matthew chapter 1 and we see words pinned down about the Lord Jesus Christ's birth. But was that technically the very first prophecy that was fulfilled and, and actually kicked things off? It wasn't, was it? What was the very first thing? The birth of John the Baptist. It was the birth of John the Baptist. Now when we look there in Malachi chapter number 4, you see there at the very end, verse number 6, a statement about Elijah the prophet, it says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now that's quoted in the New Testament about who? John the Baptist. In the book of Luke, that is quoted about John the Baptist. So it, 
gives you a prophecy of the very next thing to come. It's in a very particular order. And the very next thing that happens is the coming of John the Baptist, who is the forerunner to the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's transitioning into what we would refer to as the New Testament Scriptures. When you get to Matthew chapter number 1, it obviously begins with speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's what all of the New Testament is going to be about. That's what the New Covenant is about. If you flip over to Matthew chapter number 3, right there you have the introduction of what we're waiting for, of what we're looking for, of what Malachi 4 spoke about, which is John the Baptist. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. When we get in the New Testament, we have the Gospels that are laid out first in the order. So if we were to look at the different categories, the very first thing that we have is the Gospels. Now what is the Gospels? It's the good news. It's about salvation. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection. If you look at a Christian's life, what's the first thing that has to take place before you do anything? Are you going to church? Is that going to help you before you get saved? No, of course not, right? What's the first thing that you need to do? Get saved. That's what you, you see encapsulated in, it's the message of the gospel or the message of salvation in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the beginning of a Christian's growth, the beginning of a Christian's life. You have salvation. Then what you see next is you have the book of Acts, right? Which is the Acts of the Apostles. It's having an example for the Christian. Once you're saved, then the next thing that you have is the example for the Christian. You know, when, when Christians start coming to church immediately, Oftentimes, they're not doing in the very beginning. I mean, there are exceptions, but most people that I've seen that when they get saved right away, they don't just dive you know, into the scriptures immediately. A lot of what they rely upon is the example of other Christians. So I believe what we're seeing here is this, is this you know, kind of evolution of the Christian life. The very next thing that we see is doctrine. And it's from who? You know, Paul, right? Who is uh, in the New Testament, even Peter basically praises all the things that Paul writes. Who would be the perfect man? I mean, he's, he is, he's heavily trained and educated in the Old Testament scriptures and the law of the Old Testament. Who would be the perfect person to, to pick? It would be Paul, right? So God uses Paul, reforms Paul, you know, gives him revelations. He writes down and he pins down doctrine. So you have salvation with the Gospels. Then you have the Acts, which is the example. Then you have the doctrine. The Christian begins learning the doctrine. Then do you know what happens with the next books that basically what you see and what all of those are about? It's about works. Now it's time to get to work. Once you have the head knowledge, then you put it into practice. Even within, this is why I want to point out, even within the end of Paul's doctrinal themed or doctrinal geared letters, it starts to kind of lean more towards uh, works. The book of Hebrews is the last book that Paul authors. And it's got a lot to do with patience. It's got a lot to do with enduring. It's got a lot to do with doing work and you know, pushing unto the end, basically, right? You get into the next couple of books, the book of James. What is the whole book of James about? Works, right? 1 Peter, 2 Peter, the trying of your faith. You know, the trial of your faith is, is patience. It worketh patience, right? 1 Peter, 2 Peter. What about 1 John, 2 John, 3 John? All about works. You read through there, it's talking about loving your brother, loving your neighbor, right? Then you get into the book of Revelation. It's just like the end of, you know, the Bible. It's the perfect ending of the Bible. I believe that they're in a particular order. Now, I said all that to say this. The book of Matthew is the first of the Gospels. And I believe that even within that particular category, the Gospels are in a particular order. We're transitioning from the Old Testament to the New. At the very end of the Old Testament with Malachi, chapter number 4, it's heavily, it has a heavy Old Testament, Old Covenant type feel, doesn't it? When you get into the very first Gospel, it is the, uh, very similar to the Old Testament. Uh, one of the themes, one of the main themes of the book of Matthew is the king of the Jews. It is that Jesus is the king of the Jews. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1. It says this, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, now watch this, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So what is the overall purpose, number one, of the book of Matthew? Well, it's the life of Jesus Christ. But then it introduces him ha as, specifically, the son of David. Now, what is David known as? What do you refer to David as oftentimes? King, exactly. King of David, right? David the king. 
So it says, the son of David. So what do you think of there? Royalty. He's the king. He's, he's known as the king. What do you think of when you think of Abraham? Father of what? The Jews. He's the father of the Jews. What you have there is the theme of, the overall theme of the book of Matthew, right there in the very first verse. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. It's about the life of Jesus Christ, who is what? The son of David, who is the king, who is what? The son of Abraham, who is the father of the Jews. It's the king of the Jews. That is the overall theme of the book of Matthew. When you break down how these 14 generations are broken down, that's how the generations are broken down into groups of 14, it breaks it down the same way. It goes to David and then it goes to Abraham at the very, well that's where it begins with Abraham and then it goes to David and then it goes to the other 14 generations here. And it, and it highlights the fact that David is the king in verse number 6 and Jesse begat David the king. So we can see that emphasis right there. Uh, on David being the king. One of the other themes, as I said, the coming of Messiah, but particularly the king of the Jews. It's the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. So it makes perfect sense that within the very first book, it's going to begin to transition. It's the, most, it's the most Jewish book of all of the Gospels. It's heavily Jewish. Now, in what way do I mean that? The book of Matthew quotes more Old Testament scripture than any of the other Gospels. And it's like the top, one of the top five uh, of all of the books in the New Testament. It's one of the top five that quotes, it may even be top three, that quotes more scripture than any other book in the New Testament is the book of Matthew. It quotes more than any of, any of the other Gospels. So which of the four that quotes scripture the most is the book of Matthew. It quotes more Old Testament scripture than any other book. Uh, another point is, what we're going to see, a theme, is the rejection, Israel's rejection of their Messiah. This is huge. This is a huge theme throughout the book of Matthew. It is Israel's rejection of their Messiah. The other thing is this, the rejection of Israel. So, in return, you know, uh, in response to Israel rejecting their Messiah, Israel rejecting God, one thing that is taught in almost every parable. Let me go ahead right now and you know burst the bubble and go ahead and unlock all of the dark sayings of Jesus Christ, almost all of them in the book of Matthew because there's a ton of you know parables in the Gospels. And what almost all of them are about, the interpretation of almost all of them is, is Israel being rejected by God. Israel being replaced, if you will. That's the interpretation of a very, very many of the parables. And that's a big heavy theme throughout the book of Matthew. Uh, another thing is we're just going to read about Proverbs and parables that are spoken of. I mean, they, just about every other chapter at the very least, there is a proverb or a parable, and they're referred to as dark sayings. So the parables that we know of, we can also refer to them as, as Proverbs, and Jesus himself says that he's speaking in dark sayings. So that's what a parable is. So there's a lot of Proverbs and parables. One thing that's talked about a lot in the book of Matthew is the second coming of Christ. So the second coming of Christ when he comes back the second time. Another thing that's discussed, and you'll notice all these things, there's a lot of overlap. The other thing that's discussed is the kingdom. The kingdom is discussed. Just in a very general sense, the kingdom is discussed quite often. Now, there are, this is the last thing that I'm going to talk about real quick, and tonight's going to be a little bit shorter. There are four Gospels. Right? There are four Gospels. There are what, is, what are considered the synoptic Gospels, and then there is just one Gospel that's a non-synoptic Gospel. Now the word synoptic, it means like an overview or a survey or a brief survey. Sin, that, 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 uh, in the very beginning of that word, the prefix of synoptic, the S-Y-N, it's like the word synthetic. When something's synthetic, what is it? It's when things are blended together to make something. So S-Y-N, that prefix me means like a mix or a blend, right? And uh, optic means like to look at something, right? And like if something, if you were to be given a synopsis, like on the back of a book, Right? That's what that is referred to as. If you flip over the, book, the back of the book, if you read often, you know, and you want to decide whether you want to get a book or something, you'll flip it over to the back and you'll get a quick, what's referred to as a synopsis of that book. That's just a brief overview. Okay? So, what the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what, what it means when it says these are the synoptic Gospels, they follow in general, 
in an overview, they follow basically the same patterns in an overview. Optic means to look at something, right? You know, uh, like an op, uh, you know, an, uh, what, what is it referred to as? An optrician. Uh, what is it? That's not correct. Optometrist. optometrist. Yeah, an optometrist. Man, my brain was like, goodness sakes. An optometrist is someone that studies, you know, uh, or does work on glasses, right? They do work for glasses. When you, maybe you have, you know, uh, an issue with your glasses or frames or something, you'll go there and they'll fix your glasses for you. So, it refers to eyesight. So it's doing a brief overview, and those three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they follow, in general, like an overview of the same exact order of events. The book of John obviously does not do that, because it's a non-synoptic Gospel. It's not in the same exact category. So it is, put your arms out. Put your arms out and quit fooling around. It is totally different, right? It does not follow. When you read the book of John... It has a totally different style of writing, it has a totally different style of reading, and it has a lot of unique stories that are not found in the book of Matthew, not found in the book of Mark, and they're not found in the book of Luke, right? But when you read the book of Matthew, and this is where that theory came from, like, oh, Matthew just borrowed from Mark and then just added a bunch of stuff or whatever, right? When you read the book of Matthew and then you read the book of Mark, there's a lot of overlap. And then you read the book of Luke... There's also a lot of overlap. There's a little bit more of a difference between the book of Luke than you know, Mark and Matthew. There's a lot of similarities, even more so between Mark and Matthew than any of the other ones. And then the book of John is just totally standalone. It's got like almost, you know, there are very little similarities between John and all of the other three, right? But the reason why is for your benefit. It's to study. There are so many things. If I could you know, name for you all of the things that I've learned just by comparing the Gospels, it would be an extremely long list. So many different things and so many different categories and areas of study I've learned just from just comparing maybe quotes, just comparing maybe, you know, uh, let's say quotations from the Old Testament or Jesus speaking, all different types of things. So that's why we have, you say, so why do we have these three you know, these three Gospels that are very similar, referred to as the Synoptic Gospels, they're meant for you to study. Because the Bible is not meant only for you to read. The Bible is meant for you to study as well. Study to show thyself, thyself approved unto God. So you are supposed to be studying. It's a commandment to study your Bible. So Matthew is the very first of the Synoptic Gospels. And personally, myself, you may you know, differ. Obviously, this is just a matter of opinion. But my favorite Gospel period is Matthew. So of course of the Synoptic Gospels, my favorite Gospel is by far Matthew. And the reason why is because, is why I'm excited to start preaching about this next week, is because it includes so many different areas of teaching. There's so much in, there's so much in all the Gospels, but particularly the book of Matthew covers so much ground. And as I said, the overall theme that I want you to pay attention to is this, the King of the Jews. Now, when I went through that list of themes, this is the last thing I want to say, you would have noticed that everything that I said afterwards, I said, hey, here are some of the other themes, plural, right? Everything that I said after the king of the Jews tied in with that. When I talked about the kingdom being offered, the second coming of Christ, the, you know, Israel rejecting the Messiah, uh, uh, and then the, you know, God rejecting Israel. All of these things tie in with, in some way, Jesus being the king of Israel, or Jesus being the king of the Jews, because that is the overall theme of the book of Matthew, and you're told so right there in Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 1. So this week was more so of a Bible study even than, you know, the next 28 weeks will be, just kind of giving you some basic principles on what we're going to be getting into, giving you even more so of an overview and things to look for, and uh, so next week we will be, be beginning in Matthew chapter number 1 in our Bible study. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the Bible. We thank you for the Gospels and, and recording your words and all of the great teachings that we have. Help us to be diligent students, dear Lord, of your word. Help us to love your word, all of it, dear God. Uh, help us to learn much while we are going through as a church and studying. Uh, help us to be intent, attentive to all of these things uh, as we are uh, going through the word of God. We love you so much and just be with us. Bless all the people that are here tonight, all the families. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.